is joining us. So. Okay, Neil, I don't know if you still need the notice because I heard the recording's already underway, but we'll, we'll start in about 10 seconds. So that's your warning if you still needed it. I think we're streaming already. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, wherever you are. Hope you are all doing well. Uh, before I introduce myself and the panel, I'd just like to let you know that we have interpretation into French and Spanish for this session. So if you'd like to listen in another language, either of those two, they're your options, please click on the globe icon at the lower part of your Zoom window and select that language. Okay, my name's Rowan Bennett, and I'm a land administration advisor for Cadastre International in the Netherlands and the current chair of the International Federation of Surveyors Commission 7 on Land Management and Cadastre. And I warmly welcome you to this webinar on responsible scaling of fit for purpose land administration uh, with the sub theme of balancing tech and governance challenges. Uh, this is the first webinar in a responsible scaling series initiated by the Netherlands Enterprise Agency, acronym RVO, and the Land Portal Foundation as part of the Land at Scale program that runs out of the Netherlands. Uh, Land at Scale, as I said, is a Dutch land governance support program financed by the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs and managed by RVO. As many of you know, FFPLA is celebrated for its affordability, speed, and flexibility focus. And this puts it in contrast to conventional forms of land administration that we've used in the past. Its origins date back well over 10 years, although it's the acronym and the catch line we have been using uh, in the domain for, for the past decade. Uh, the model itself, um, or, or philosophy itself, really um, interweaves both the spatial and legal, but also institutional dimensions and a lot of work by the World Bank, a lot of work by FIG, but also the Global Land Tool Network underpins the uh, global uh, formulation of FFPLA. So today's focus uh, for us in this webinar will be this juxtaposition between the rapid technological advances that we've been seeing in the domain and the geospatial domain in terms of data collection and the often slower evolution of the legal and institutional in, uh, frameworks that enable those. So while, while we can gather data swiftly and build technical systems more cost effectively, the long term considerations regarding maintenance, updates, and so forth remain really paramount and key issues, when, especially when we start to talk about scalability. So we're going to delve in the next 90 minutes or so into um, deeply into the intricacies of legal and institutional uh, aspects uh, that are essential for sustainable land governance shifts. And we're going to look at uh, striking the right balance or our participants and our um, speakers will talk about experiences in terms of how to strike that right balance between technology and the fundamental blocks that are key to achieving lasting and scaled impact. So we hope to shed light on integrating these strategies and to emphasize the significance of involving non-technical stakeholders outside the surveying and land administration domain in the conversation. Few logistical uh, notes before we begin. The webinar, as you may have seen, is being streamed live on multiple platforms. And please note that live tweeting is occurring for this event from the Land Portal Twitter account. And the hashtag we are using is hashtag land at scale. So feel free to join in the conversation there. We have created a social media kit for the event, uh, which has been shared with you in the chat. So take a look in the chat now if you want to get access to that. And if you do have questions, we would encourage you to post them in the Q&A uh, sec section. And you can get that by clicking the Q&A button, button at the bottom of the screen. And we are going to answer those questions later on in the webinar as much as we can get to, noting that we have got several hundred participants and a bit more registered for this uh, webinar. Uh, just finally, in the interest of transparency, I should add that today's session is being recorded and you will receive the link to the video afterwards. Also, an article with the key messages will be made available later in the Land Portal's website. Okay, that's all the background and logistical matters out of the way. Let's get down to business. 
and allow me to introduce our excellent speakers. So I'm joined by a really exciting panel today, uh, and they're going to be helping me and uh, and you unpack the issues that I've just remained up, uh, mentioned up above. So in in no particular order, uh, or if there is, I certainly didn't put the order together. Uh, here are our speakers. First, we have uh, Rem, Remy Daria. <laughs> Daira Giji. Sorry, Remy, I'm just terrible at the um, pronunciation, but you'll correct me, I'm sure. And Remy is uh, a VNG international I'll country rep. <laughs> Sorry, Remy. Country. <laughs> I, I did rehearse that before we started, and I just totally mucked it up for you. So uh, forgive me. Um, his uh, VN VNGs, who he will explain what that is, in uh, international countries representative in Burundi. He's a governance expert. Uh, who's been working with passion on local governance, peace building and, uh, and conflict transformation and gender transformation issues in the domain and that country. And he's done that so for 15 years in different contexts, including Burundi, but also South Sudan, Chad and Malawi. So welcome, Remy. Our second uh, panelist is Christelle Vandenberg, and she's the regional manager for Cadastro International. Uh, and she collaborates with ministries, embassies, universities, global businesses, and financial partners, including the World Bank and the European Union uh, in her work. And she manages an expert team focused in on uh, the African context and actively contributes to national land administration modernization programs. And I guess the, the, the uh, um, key one there in the last few years uh, in her portfolio has been the country of Benin. So we'll be hearing about that shortly. Our third hello, speaker Rowan. is. Thank welcome. you, Rowan, and hello. Yes, no, welcome aboard. Our third speaker, sorry, I'm not even giving people a chance to say hello, but um, I'm conscious of time, but thank you, and do cut on me as ne needed. Third speaker is the excellent Israel Tawau, from, who is our young professional, so we've got the young professionals covered as well. Uh, he's also chair of FIG Commission 7. Point, uh, uh, well, Working Group 7.2. Uh, and he'll explain a little bit what that is, uh, but it is focused specifically on FFPLA. Uh, he is a geomatics lecturer at the Federal Polytechnic of Adi Akiti in Nigeria. Uh, he champions the use of geospatial science for sustainable development and bridges the academic practical divide in that regard. With a robust background in geotechnical, uh, geospatial tech and roles in national and international surveying bodies, he's deeply committed to local and global impact. So, Israel, welcome aboard. Okay. And Al, you want to say something? <laughs> we maybe should have rehearsed. Yeah. Hello. Thank you so okay. much, Rohan. You're welcome. Welcome aboard. No, great to have you here. And our final uh, panelist is Pak Virgo Eresta Jaya, who is General Director of the Land and Spatial Survey and Mapping uh, Directorate for uh, the Ministry of Agrarian Affairs and Spatial Planning and the National Land Agency in Indonesia. And he also serves on the Honorary Council of the Indonesian Surveyors Association and is the Vice Chair of the Working Group on Cadastre and Land Management for the UNGGIM in Asia Pacific region. So they're our speakers, that's the background and the way we're running the webinar is typical of uh, how we run land portal webinars where we've got um, a range of questions and we'll be buzzing around to our different speakers and threading th uh, through them uh, and then eventually leading to the more open Q&A uh, session. So to get things uh, rolling, um, I, I've, got, I've got an opening general question really to, to all the panellists uh, because I think it's important that we get a, get a baseline view on where you all stand and how you understand the concept. So um, I, I'm going to ask all the panellists uh, how they understand the term FFPLA, uh, whether they feel it's a passing fad or is it just a rebranding of something that's been before? Or is there something new and of real substance here when we talk about FFPLA? Uh, what's all the buzz about? Um, so uh, I'm going to first uh, give the floor to Israel, our youngest member of the panel. Israel, tell us about FFPLA from your perspective. Thank you so much, Rohan, and good afternoon to everybody from uh, everywhere in the world. I'm excited to be in this place and uh, I'm happy that I have this opportunity to tell you about FFPLA, which is what uh, the 
uh, FIG working group 7.2 does. Yeah, I'd like to say that FFPLE is both a concept and an approach to land administration and management. And what it does is to ensure the flexibility, inclusiveness, participatoriness, affordability, reliability, attainability, and upgradability of land administration and management practices. Now, when I say flexible, it means both the legal, the institutional, and spatial frameworks uh, are flexible enough to serve the needs of the population it, uh, that it intends to meet. And then also inclusive to ensure that there is everybody can interact with the uh, land administration system to be able to access uh, security for their tenure. Also participatory uh, such that the population itself, the people can as well be able to interact with the, with the system and then affordable. So cost won't be a problem while somebody does not have uh, security to his uh, tenure. And then uh, reliable, time bound, and then upgradable. Also, I would like to quickly say concerning the question that Ron asked about if it's a passing fad or not. I would like to say the term FFPLE cannot be a passing fad, not in the sight of all of the inefficient and ineffective uh, or unsustainable land and fuel practices that we have all over in different parts of the world. I mean, we have challenges ranging from tenure insecurity to inequitable access to land, and then to gender deprivation, and then to informal land markets, environmental degradation, underutilization of land resources, barriers to economic growth, and just so many of them. Now, all these things, with all of this, the FFPLE cannot be a passing fad because it seeks to uh, use all the six principles I mentioned earlier to address some of these challenges or all of these challenges. And I like to say that as long as ineffective and inefficient and unsustainable land uh, additional practices exist, the concept and the approach of fit for purpose land administration will always remain imperative. I mean, uh, it's never going to be a passing fad, rather it represents a significant shift in how we manage our land, in how land has been administered. And it's having a special focus on practicality and cost effectiveness to ensure that security of tenure can be ensured not just for a population, but for the whole population that it's supposed to serve. Uh, I'd like to conclude on this first question, Rohan, that uh, FFPL is a substantive approach to land administration. And I say that because, uh, not just because of the nomenclature FFPL as an academic term or a professional term, but rather I like to say that FFPL is actually uh, something that you and I can interact with, and then it's something that we need to uh, look at professionally. And of course, in reality, it's working in practice. I mean, in practice, we have people out there who are implementing these principles. Myself, personally, I've done that before. And then all of us, uh, most of us in this place who have interest in land matters, uh, actually have implemented FFPLE at one point or the other. So I think I'll have to stop for now because of my time. Thank you so much, <laughs> Thanks very much, uh, Israel, for giving us the opening uh, opening lines there. And I think you've given us quite a, a positive and comprehensively positive view on your views as a young professional and a young academic working in the land sector uh, with regards to what FFPLA offers and how it can be implemented. I want to now jump over to uh, Virgo, who obviously works in a different country in a different context and at a different scale, so to speak. I mean, Indonesia's got some incredible numbers around it. Uh, Virgo, what's, what's your initial thoughts uh, to the question I asked earlier about uh, FFPLA and what it offers or maybe doesn't offer? Okay. Thank you, Rohan. Uh, so good evening, everyone. It's 8 p.m. here in Indonesia, so a bit dark here. <laughs> uh, not a good lighting. But thank you, Rahan, for the question. Uh, as a practitioner and a policymaker, I think uh, for Indonesian government, FFP or Fit for Purpose Land Administration is it's just a matter of choice between three options, between the speed, the price, and the quality. So which one do you choose? So uh, before then, uh, it was a very long and expensive process in land registration in Indonesia. So it's not affordable for everyone. Uh, and we choose at a time, which is the good quality because we want to secure the title. And because of that, the process is lengthy and only the, 
the rich people can afford uh, to register their land, yeah, uh, especially to secure the title and also for getting loan uh, from the bank. So the land registration for the last, uh, from the 1960 to 90 to the 2015 is actually driven by the people, by the people. So government realized that, and in the last five years since uh, 2015, the government taking this into into serious matter, right? And then uh, we think that we should attract the investment, and uh, we want to have a mass land registration. So we choose the first two options, the speed and the low price first. So uh, we we try our best in the last couple of years, like five, uh, seven, six years, uh, to have the FFP uh, using the cheap method and the speedy method. So, and uh, for the last question, is it a passing fact? Uh, I don't think so because I think the option, the those three option, will be relevant. I think in a quite long time, and uh, only probably our choices uh, shifted. Yeah, uh, whether right now uh, the purpose is to give all people uh, the title or uh, to register their land. Probably in the future, uh, the purpose is to to increase the accuracies, but the FFP itself, the three options, uh, the speed, the quality, and the price will remain the same and will remain uh, long lasting. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Virgo. And I'm really glad you've brought up this, uh, this tripartite issue of, of speed, cost, and quality, because it has been that, you know, that triangle of uh, the challenging triangle where we normally can only get two two uh, points out of the three satisfied, but as you've sort of mentioned there, with with technology development um, and new ways of thinking about process, all of a sudden the ability to move towards um, you know achieving all three at once um, becomes a reality. Not there yet, but obviously more so than it was previously. Um, Christelle, I want to bring you in there uh, and for your thoughts. Uh, you've, we've heard from academia, we've heard from um, yeah, the, the appliers in government. Uh, you, you work with a, a development a, a agency and, and with donors. What's your, what's your view on uh, FFPLA with your uh, most recent country level experience? Thank you, Rowan. Uh, thank you. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Land Portal and the Land at Scale team, RVO, to invite me for this uh, webinar. Um, well, what uh, regards your question, Rowan, I don't think that fit for purpose is a passing part at all. I would rather say it's as the beginning uh, of the development, um, because by now it has become like a well-known concept in the domain of land or land administration, land governance. And this is, I think, really different than 10 years ago. However, and this is where I maybe come a bit, but a bit more critical, we must be careful that fit for purpose won't become like a general term or some kind of buzzword, I would say. Uh, of course, everyone wants affor affordable tenure security for all people in a short time, but it entails a lot, according to me. Yeah, lands and land tenure security, it is about uh, it is about data collection, about registration, data storage, maintenance. It, it's about data dissemination. And yeah, the reason why I said fit for purpose is at the beginning of the development is that the focus of fit for purpose, according to me and what I see in my work is still a bit too much on the data collection side. Uh, and, and, and to make it affordable for everyone in a short time, it means, according to me, it's finding smart, good enough solutions for every step. And yeah, this is why I also would say do not scale up uh, until all these steps are covered. And I think this is where we mm -hmm. are going to talk about uh, during this um, yeah. webinar about scaling up. And this is, uh, yeah, I would like to raise. Uh, Thanks, Christa. Yeah, and I think it's, and that is absolutely right um, in terms of what we are going to unpack in this webinar, because it is all about scaling and um you know, while the FFPLA tools are there for the parcel level or, you know, numbers, hundreds of parcels, when we start talking millions, it's where those those governance and institutional issues really have to be um, 
thought of early and, and dealt with early. Um, so thanks for raising that. And we will definitely come back to that. Uh, Remy, you've been sitting there patiently. Uh, can we get uh, your initial insights from your experiences more in the uh, e eastern eastern part of Africa? Um, I'm a bit unsure whether I'm hearing Remy. Ah, just connecting. Are you good to go, Remy? He may have just dropped off for a second. Okay. Uh, uh, Remy, we're just coming back to you for the first question, your initial views on FFPLA. So floor is yours. Yeah, uh, uh, for, me, uh, it's an approach to... for me, it's a, a governance approach, land governance. It's an approach that really regards technical issues. Uh, we need to be reliable. We need to be financially financially reliable. And it should give a land uh, management system, meaning that the land can be um, exploited easily. And it should facilitate uh, political procedures. My understanding of the FFPLA um, is really in line with this. But also, it's about rights. Rights that take into uh, account uh, securing rights in terms of land management. It also uh, concerns certain ideas that my predecessors uh, took into account. Is it uh, just a passing fad? No, no, it's not. It actually takes into account the future. It's a long-term concept because it's based on a holistic analysis. And it's good that we're going to take this into account. It has a direct impact on communities and it considers uh, power aspects within all of this, power dynamics. was is should this be considered a stable approach well i didn't quite the question there are we all still together yeah we're all still together Remy. If, and if you want to say a little bit more on that then i'm more than welcome to but... Mm -hmm. I think for now, I'm just going to stop there. I was saying that it's not about, uh, it's not an academic question, but it's something that has an effect on our real citizens today. And we also, it's also really about concerning our rights. So there you go. That's my contribution to the first question you asked. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Remy, and thank you all the panellists for getting us going. Uh, as you can see there, we've got a bit of a unanimous panel on thought, uh, you know, baseline thoughts on FFPLA. Is it relevant? Yes. Does it work? Yes. But a few um, mentions uh, of the concerns around scaling uh, with regards to, uh, to institutional and governance issues, and, and that's why we're having this webinar, because we've been able to show in pilot and demonstrations absolutely for over a decade that FFPLA works. We've got great examples of countries where it works at scale, but we've still got examples of land administration projects where we do struggle to get results, even sometimes when so-called FFPLA techniques are being applied. So why is there the difference? Let's now drill down into some more specific questions targeting on each of our panelists and their 
their area of interest and, and uh, specialty. Israel, I want to come back to you. You're our designated younger professional um, and, you know, obviously working in Nigeria uh, in, in both uh, training of uh young land administration uh, practitioners, but also a bit in the field with your practice. Uh, are you are you seeing FFPLA now mainstreamed into the courses in, in Nigeria and in the region? And are you seeing it practiced more in the field by uh, perhaps not only emerging graduates, but also older, older hands in the land administration sector? Over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Rohan. Uh, I'll say yes. It's an emphatic yes that gradually the FFPLA is being mainstreamed into training and practice. And I would like to say also that the concept comes with practical implications at the grassroots level, so where it empowers communities and their individuals to secure their own land rights in a cost effective and pragmatic manner. Now, the, the, the importance of the concept and will continue to grow as tenure of security remains crucial issue in many parts of the world. More importantly, who, uh, the successes that has been experienced in various countries, like in Rwanda, in Ghana, in Uganda, and so many other parts of the world, uh, makes it evident that FFPLA is being mainstreamed into practice. For example, in Rwanda, where 100% uh, coverage of land registration was read, was recorded some years back, that's a very great news. That's a good news for the whole concept itself. And not just that, in Uganda as so well. In Uganda in particular, I personally volunteered in the uh, uh, land administration process in Padel in 2018 during a pilot. And that was with the Volunteer Community Service Program. And after this time, I am happy to always hear of the good news of how these practices have been upscaled gradually and going into the, the, the mainstream of what is now practicable in, in Uganda as a nation to have for their to secure their tenure rather now not just that even in ghana in ghana i like the idea of ghana because like uh what crystal who mentioned it that we shouldn't consider ffpla as a buzzword but in ghana i like the idea that the name doesn't come like ffpla it comes like something digitalization and then but most importantly is that the principles of the ffpla are being used and then it's fast tracking land registration and it's making tenure security, I mean, it's making people have access to better security of their own tenure. I mean, it's giving them access to the land insurance system, they're able to access it better, they're able to, they are assured of the process the more, and that is what it is. And these things are coming into practice to stay. So i like to also say that there are challenges in transforming from pilots to scale though, but then uh, with increased capacity building and advocacy and then migration, of fit for people's approaches into service delivery. I believe that these challenges will uh, be overcome. So uh, I think I should stop here for now again, Rohan. Thank you so much. Thanks, Israel, for uh, explaining how uh, in, in those various countries you've mentioned, uh, you're seeing it, it, it trans, the, the concept translated into both uh, education and, and practice. Um, let's, let's move, let's move uh, back to Virgo. Uh, Virgo, um, you know, in the Indonesian sometimes very, very humble, but it's it's not without saying that ATR BPN and uh, has an Indonesian more generally has achieved something quite remarkable over the last five years. Uh, often, and I, and Israel, you you mentioned earlier the case of Rwanda. That's kind of been the 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 story of FFPLA that's been cited over the last uh, over the last decade in terms of you know that really scaled implementation, countrywide coverage using using imagery, using um, grassroots surveyors to collect around 10 million parcels in a number of years, which was quite, you know, unprecedented comparatively. Uh, but Ind Indonesia has kind of gone at a magnitude greater on that. So, um, you know, it's not without its challenges. But can you tell us how FFP, I think you already did it earlier, you did tell us how how and why FFP LA was adopted, but perhaps you can give us a little bit more detail about that story and what's really driven it and some of the um, the outcomes and results you've been seeing over the last uh, five years. Okay, thank you, uh, Rohan. Uh, probably I should inform you that uh, Indonesia is not as lucky as a European country. <laughs> I just uh, come back from Netherlands and just informed that Netherlands has finished their 
Kadasa in 1803 or 1806, uh, whole parcel has been surveyed and mapped. Uh, in Indonesia, we've, we've been struggling to register uh, the whole land parcel since 1960, since we introduced our land registration. Until 2015, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, register, the registered parcel were only uh, 46 million parcels. The annual progress approximately less than 1 million parcel per year. So uh, even we don't know what is the total number of, <laughs> of the parcel in Indonesia. And we do the estimation. The estimation is around 126 million parcels in Indonesia because in Indonesia we manage our cadastres uh, centralized. Yeah. So if with the current speed, uh, less than 1 million, probably the next 80 million, so the next 80 years, we will, we will have our complete land registration in all over Indonesia. So the change actually uh, driven by our new government, our new president, uh, who wants to attract investment as much as possible. Uh, so we will, we want to raise our rank in every indicator, in every indicator, uh, attractive investment indicator, including ease of doing business indicator, registering property, every indicator. Our president push push us to to higher our rank. And in land registration, uh, we need they ask us to do what do you call it extraordinary method. So I think FFP is the, the right one yeah, uh, for us. Uh, put aside the good quality, put aside the good accuracy first. Uh, we more focus uh, on the total number. So in 2015, we start with the 3 million and then uh, the following year, 16, 5 million. And since 2017, uh, we also help our, uh, by the World Bank loan. Uh, and then at that starting that time, we call it our project with the FFP, Land Administration. Uh, the, the complete name is Systematic Complete Land Registration Using the Participatory Mapping. So we ask everyone, we ask people to help us, in, we we put all our resources, all of our budget, uh, and some part of our budget also funded by the World Bank. And the uh, progress is, is uh, with, the, with all the efforts. Uh, right now, we managed to register 107 million parcels, so 19 million parcels to go uh, in the next two years. Hopefully, we can achieve those targets in, in one or two years. Okay, thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Park Fogo. Yeah, it's, it's a really uh, a really remarkable story, and I really encourage people to look into that one, one further. How it was done, I think you've mentioned a few good points there. Uh, one of the key ones there, obviously, it being a presidential target, and I think that's what we also saw in the case of Rwanda. When it's a high-level priority, you get that mobilization of, of, of the agency, but also the resources to, to do the kind of work, and then you get the donor buy-in as well, if they can see that support. Uh, I think another thing you've mentioned there, Pak Virgo, which is an interesting one in both your responses, is this purpose the changing purpose. So you, you've really focused in on let's get the tenure security right first before we worry about other purposes uh, that might be to do with, you know, economic development and so forth. And that can then inform the uh, type of technologies um, and approaches that are being used. Um, so thanks very much for that. Let's let's go back to Remy. Uh, Remy, We've heard a bit from Indonesia there. We've mentioned Rwanda. I guess that in, in both those cases, you might say uh, it's been quite a centralised uh, approach, uh, FFPLA approach, if we want to call it that, quite successful, uh, as we've heard. Uh, you're working in Burundi, and whilst Burundi is obviously a close neighbour to Rwanda, the governance context is quite different. So can you let us know how FFPLA is being implemented uh, in your eyes in Burundi? Oui, uh, Burundi. Yes, of course. In Burundi, 
well, it's quite different to Rwanda. They're, they're neighboring countries and they're good friends. We share the same assets, uh, positive points, but also the same faults. For example, we do have one common challenge, that is uh, demographic problems and uh, uh, traveling problems. On a political level, one country is more advanced than another. Concerning land administration, it's true that Rwanda has stood out in the past few years compared to Burundi. We are still working in Burundi on this issue, and we're trying to really um, tap into this issue, uh, particularly uh, concerning legal tax and enshrining this in law. We're putting a lot of focus into this. We're also trying to uh, secure land on a local, local level and secure it properly. Local administrations are taking care of this. But of course, we also want to work on conflict uh, conciliation uh, concerning land security. Um, land administration and uh, management is a very important issue. We need to make sure that it's financially viable. And to do this, we also need, we need to really tap into a legal system that is clear. Over the past 10 years, we developed a legal framework, but there's still work to be done to tap into a framework uh, in, on this level and continue what we've already been doing in order to centralize the management of land. Land has been uh, dealt with in several different ways and lots of different decisions have been made. Our justice system is trying to look into the issue further. We now we need to put extra effort into trying to qualify this administration and these systems in regard to the law. Everything needs to be centralized and land needs to be managed from a central perspective. So there are still questions that need to be addressed. If I may say, local governments, governments need to really provide services to help us work in this respect, to combine our skills. Infrastructures must be put in place so that we can have systems and well in terms of expertise in general so that management can be taken care of centrally governance needs to be written into law so that local authorities can serve other types of actors in the domain for example banks when we're talking about resolving conflicts, for example. But if there are no legal basis for this, then it's a problem. We need to really put into place operational systems. We equally need to apply this when we're speaking about raising awareness. For example, we need uh, land certificates. We need to link up the local level and a more global level. In a wide, from a wider perspective, there are many actors who are involved in this. Uh, 
and many exchanges have taken place, uh, conversations, for example, in terms of how feasible it is to put in place a land management system, more centralized system. We've exchanged with Rwanda to try and uh, understand this more. And this gave us a lot of help, hope. We need a land administration system that is exploitable, able to be used and is practicable, practical. that local actors can use, but we also need it to be a system that responds to issues that are central. We want to aim for a uh, system that is not far from our neighbor's system, similar to Rwanda. Thank you very much. Th thanks uh, very much, Remy. I think you touched on a whole range of issues there um, when it comes to somehow uh, getting FFP LA activity happening at that local level. And as you've said, historically, land and the governance of that is a local uh, activity in Burundi. But then moving towards and recognising the real value of the administrative system is when uh, when you can also provide some some information and some benefits to that central level. And so you've touched on whole range of aspects, particularly relating to the UNGTIM framework for effective land administration or FALA, um, many of those pathways you are raising there uh, that need to be considered. So everything from uh, governance, institutions, legal uh, issues, but also financial aspects, awareness raising, education and training. So um, really good coverage of those. Uh, remember, everyone, if you've got questions and you're, you're, they're coming up as, as the speakers are speaking, we're not taking um, questions immediately within the first uh, series of questions that I'm asking to the panellists, but you can use the Q&A box, which is down the bottom of your screen, and put a uh, question in there. There's already some filling up there, and we're definitely going to come back and revisit those ones in the, in the final half hour or so of this webinar. Uh, Christelle, I'm going to jump over to you. Uh, you work with donors um, and uh, in, in the Africa region mainly. You're often putting in for projects and tenders and so forth. Um, how much is this term FFPLA or the concepts behind it? How, how much is it? How much demand is there from the donors? And at the same time, you know, a donor project usually needs to have a beneficiary, a beneficiary country or agency. How, how much demand is there from the beneficiaries? And ha have you even seen this changing over, over time in your role? Yeah, well, I th what I see in my daily work is that it's demanded by many donors. I mean, the terms of ref references that, uh, that uh, yeah, are provided by the donors, they use this terminology, terminology all over the place. And this is also why I wanted to mention, why I mentioned earlier that we don't need to uh, yeah, it do doesn't have to become a, 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 some kind of buzzword, yeah? like fit for purpose, land administration solves all our problems, so to say. And, and uh, what I see in my daily work is that those terms of reference uh, talk a lot about uh, the purposes of land administration, like, uh, like climate resilience, like conflict management, um, uh, yeah, full and productive employment, all those kind of purposes that uh, where land administration a sustainable land administration perfectly can contribute to, but in the end, it all starts with complete up to date and thus reliable data. Um, and getting there, that takes a lot of time and money. This is also what you posted uh, earlier uh, during, uh, in this webinar. So I think it, it, it re requires a strong leadership from decision makers, not only from politicians, but also from the chain partners involved in creating that complete and up to date uh, land data. And in my opinion, uh, the time frame of many tender projects and also the available budgets are often still too limited to really establish a system that provides these data. And okay, there are some larger tenders in, in terms of budget and, 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 and time frame, so the multi-annual programs, um, but they, well, they most of the time entail like the development of large IT systems of large uh, titling programs, but they do not always cover the whole spectrum of land administration and not 
the like the the, the, the framework of land of, of fit for purpose, like the legal part, the institutional part, and the spatial part. And also from the beneficiary side, hey, you ask me the question: Is this the same demand there for beneficiaries? What I see also in my daily work is that there are still beneficiaries that ask for a full-fledged land administration system, if I may say it like that. And then, and then most of the times in, in, in terms of IT systems that have many functionalities and so on, but uh, the data in itself, it's not there. So I would rather say, I would say start with small systems, also IT-wise uh, start in a fit for purpose way, start small and then uh, yeah, increment over time. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if this has been changed mm -hmm. all over the time. What I do see, and this is, well, I come back to that later in the case of Benin, is that uh, when we started, um, yeah, the, the, the ambition of the government was to have a fully digitized cadaster and, and, and so on, and with great ambitions, and you start working on it, and it's, yeah, we all see, see how, uh, yeah, what it's, what it's, takes to get there so the how to say the ambitions uh well do not change over time but we see that um, um that that fit for purpose land administration is adopted more and more thanks thanks christelle so um yeah what we're hearing there is is obviously uh donors on board beneficiaries demanding it although still still issues like uh scale of it systems and i think that uh, that question of the it system we want to like trying to come back and revisit that a little bit later because essentially FFPLA, when we think about it, is not so much about the back end storage of data and, and the manipulation and the development of the IT system, although it is covered in the uh, in the frameworks if you have a look at the uh, documentation around FFPLA. It's been something more focused on getting that scaled data collection uh, in the field. Uh, but it's a really good point you raised, Christelle. If you've got all the data in the world, but no capacity or, or fit for purpose systems, IT systems in the background, then um, you, we, we see countries running into problems there where the maintenance and sustainability of those systems is comes under question. Yeah, sure, yeah. Jump, jump on the top of that. <laughs> because what I meant, <laughs> meant to say is that, that they ask the full-fledged IT system, but the data in it, that lacks. So that is that is also a problem because you can have a full-fledged system, but if there is no data in it, mm. you can still wonder how, yeah, do we still, yeah. is that fit for purpose? Do we, do you then meet the purpose of land administration? Yeah, no, good questions. Concern. And thanks for putting those on the table. I think we're going to have more discussion around that. Uh, let's, um, let's, let's go again back to Israel. Uh, I think I first heard of you israel uh maybe only a year ago when you you came onto the scene uh at fig and and revealed this uh uh question uh, this survey or study you'd been conducting on african countries and you you're obviously african um and uh you, so you were running a study in on the continent uh going to, uh, and doing a lot of work in terms of developing that but also getting it filled in you've been running that over a number of years so ffpla applied in in african countries uh by africans and we and we we can be honest on that you know the technique the philosophy did what was developed for um or, or created for some of the issues and challenges happening in more developing contexts although you know the pr principles and philosophies are pretty much those that we find in any surveying and education um, thinking and in, in, in ed educational programs fundamentally um, but tell us what you've been finding in in that study because I know it's ongoing uh, what what have you found how is it being perceived and uh, what, what's the future hold? give us give us a give us your spin thank you so much Rohan yeah you're correct myself and a couple of friends in Africa did a survey in the year 2022 uh, it was after a wisdom workshop of the Volunteer Community Service Program. And then the study did meet some significant or uh, revealed some significant findings. One of such is, that, is the fact that uh, there are ineffective and unsustainable approaches to land administration in African countries. I mean, it was obvious. Now, the, the survey was done such that surveyors, the public, everybody who wanted to feel the questionnaire actually responded to the survey and 
it's, it's, it's interesting that the result is coming from the general public and even the professionals that indeed there, there is an acceptance of the fact that there are ineffective and unsustainable approaches to land administration in many African countries. And then uh, how well these existing systems capture the various types of rights and the population is quite weak. And, it, and this calls for a system that is more fit for the purpose of recording the rights and ensuring that uh, the security of people's tenure. You see, I'll, I've always loved to ask the question that why should we have approaches that are not fit for purpose in the first place? Because I assume and I always imagine that we should be able to put a round peg in a round hole. So when there are problems like this, I expect that we should be able to have uh, the appropriate solution that addresses such problems. And that is what the fit for purpose approach tends to do. Also from that survey that was conducted at that time, uh, the responses obtained also show that the fit for purpose approaches to land administration has positively impacted land administration in the African continents. I mean, a majority of those who responded to that survey. I would not want to maybe start really now statistics, but then I think the, 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 the topic of that survey of the paper written from it, an FIG publication is, is uh, an analysis of fit for purpose land uh, demarcation practices in Africa are the emergence of the fit of, no, I think I got that wrong now. I could paste it in the chat box before the end of the, the webinar. But I'll just like to say that it's built up on the principles of fit for purpose approaches. I mean, the survey used the principles to analyze how land is being administered in various countries in Africa. And we did have responses from uh, Nigeria, of course, where I live myself, uh, from Ghana, from South Africa, from uh, Uganda, from Rwanda, from a lot of countries across Africa. And then it reveals uh, some of these things. It also shows that the application of FFPLA approach in African countries varies according to different levels, different levels of technical, of technological resources and then capacity, different levels of, of, uh, of, of adoption and and different levels in so many spheres. Look at it from any angle. It's not on a particular definition. It's not as if uh, there is something coming and they would just have to accept it the way it is. It's like when it gets to this country, they redefine it in their own uh, way. And which is one thing I so much like, especially the, when the first principle of the fit for purpose approach says flexibility. So it means that when you come to your country, you have been able to adapt and then adopt what works best for that society. So also, I like to say that the findings suggest that there is need for more research and investments to develop effective, sustainable land administration systems in Africa. And when I say investment, I'm talking of, of course, finance is one, but then more importantly, it's maybe to look to identify the gaps because this whole uh, thing is not a is not a global practice that there is a, uh, a a particular solution that solves the problem. It is what every local context may need to now look at what happens in their own environment and then design an approach that solves that problem. So I know again I'm half time, uh, Rohan. So I I like to stop at this point. Thank, thank you so much. Thank, no thanks, Israel, and and I'm very impressed as a young young academic, you're uh, both plugging your own uh, paper, which is a good paper. So please uh, uh, put it in the in the box. Uh, and um, so getting your getting your own paper out there is a very good thing young academics do and also asking for research funding in the area you're working on. So two box tick there, very good. Um, but more, you know, and, and that is important. But the um, yeah, importantly, there, uh, I think, your survey is, is rather interesting in that, um, you know, it, it's, it's revealing a very positive uh, appreciation of FFPLA, which you've already mentioned earlier. Uh, but it wasn't that long ago that you could sit within a room of surveyors, even at an international conference, but maybe particularly more at a local conference and have, you know, 90% opposed to uh, some of the aspects of, of an FFPLA type implementation. So it shows there has been a bit of a seismic shift in thinking about FFPLA as not really a threat to the profession, but perhaps an opportunity for the profession uh, to do more work and, and, and better work and, and be more responsive to society's needs. Okay, let's go back to uh, Pac Vertigo. Um, 
you know, Indonesia's now got a bit of a track record on uh, its application of FFPLA. And and it's interesting to watch from afar in Indonesia is the way, uh, and you've mentioned it a bit already, uh, the FFPLA approach has, has been changed and evolving over time. So can you give us a little bit of information on how, what those changes are and, and why the approach has been changing? Okay. <clears throat> So if I divide the Indonesian uh, registration, is the first 55 years, we call it sporadic registration. And uh, since 2015 until 2022, it's the FFP, but uh, we call it, it's the mass land registration period. Uh, since this year, uh, we change it to systematic complete land registration period. So at the beginning, uh, at the beginning of this project, 2015, as I said, it is, it is not really systematic complete land registration. It's only people-driven mass land registration. So before uh, the landowner come to our office and then they pay for the survey, pay for the registration to get the title. Uh, once uh, the project begin, uh, the government pay for all of those things. The government pay for the surveys, the government pay for the uh, uh, land registration. So it's quite a successful people coming and then we manage to have a three, five million per year until uh, eight million per year. But, uh, but last year we realized that uh, not all people actually, not all the landowner comes forward. Okay, so uh, we changed our our approach for the participatory mapping. Uh, before the landowner participate, uh, then we realized that we need to survey all of those parcel. So for the participatory perspective, we change not only uh, the landowners can participate, but also the villagers, the village official, village head. Uh, they help us, they assisted us to show them the boundaries, to show them this one, uh, owned by whom, and something like that. So, uh, so that since this year, we managed to, to survey all the parcel. There is no single hole, there is no single centi square centimeters left behind uh, starting this year. Because, you know, uh, in our previous mass land registration, we forgot to do, what do you call it? To integrate between our legacy data with the new incoming data. So in our cadaster, there will be gap overlap because it was, it was done in different method, in different time, uh, different projection, different, uh, what do you call it? Different reference, something like that. So, uh, starting this year, uh, starting this year, uh, we may we are what we call it integrated systematic complete land registration. Uh, what we're doing now, uh, before we do it, we have a satellite imagery, satellite imagery, the, la, the first five years of the project. Now, uh, UAV mapping has become cheaper in Indonesia. So starting this year, we use UAV mapping, UAV mapping in Indonesia, and then the UAV mapping. And we don't only ask the people, uh, we, are, we also ask the villager. So every single parcel are surveyed and mapping uh, starting this, this year. Uh, if there, so I also answered the Q&A question from Fatime yeah, about about how do we deal with the legacy data with the registered parcel. So what we're doing is we're updating, updating the registered parcel also. Uh, our budget is a quarter of the new incoming. So if I pay 100 for the uh, incoming parcel, new incoming parcel, I pay 25% for updating the, the registered parcel, the same, the orientation and also the scale, everything. So uh, it's quite uh, challenging because in Indonesia, uh, 
certificate of title is is sacred ya yeah? uh, you cannot change the area if the area is already mentioned 107 square meters you after the updating it changed probably more probably less uh, yeah it's it's quite challenging to tell our people to tell our staff and also to tell the the owners yeah uh, that uh, it doesn't really matter it's just a calculation <laughs> but uh, we also updating the since this year we also updating the the registered parcel also and uh, why we doing you every map uh before we're doing the we have a uh, uh, satellite imagery as a as a base now we're doing uav map with the accuracy uh 0.5 meters now and resolution uh 15 centimeters uh we put the budget on it but also we have a collaboration with the with the startup with the community In indonesia there is a new startup yeah like a youtube but it's youtube for drone <laughs> so people who are doing drone for five hectares seven hectares they upload and on those uh the name is mapa id and i collaborate with them and i get more than one million hectares of drone free free in indonesia and we put our budget for for the rest uh, of the area so since this year the change is we using the photo map we using uh, our own budget our world bank budget and also the community uh, the community result of the not on not only the parcel but also the the photo map itself so before our accuracy stated in our regulation is 0.3 but now our 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 photo map is around 0.5 meters accuracy but that's okay that's the gradually yeah. improve yeah, yeah. the accuracy in indonesia okay thank you thanks uh pak virgo yeah a lot a lot in your statements just there um but uh, i think particularly the embracing of uh innovation and, and a sort of problem solving or opportunity taking mentality with, within the agency uh, allows you to move pretty swiftly and pretty quickly onto opportunities like UAV, which really wasn't a viable or sort of matured option up until, you know, five five or so years ago. And now you're, you're using that at scale and not only your own in-house imagery capture, but, you know, civilian imagery capture, because why, you know, we can assess the quality and we can make use of it. So as a halfway approach, why not make use of it? So really um, some good lessons there in terms of having a culture of innovation within the organization. Let's go back to uh, uh, Pak Virgo. Uh, sorry, I want to thank Pak Virgo and go to uh, Remy. Um, with uh, Burundi, as you've already mentioned, being more more decentralized, can you give us a little bit more on how uh, the local community, I mean, you talked about sort of the big picture before about needing to marry up the local and the, and the central, but can you drill down a bit more for us in terms of how local committees are supporting the FFPLA process to give us that real, I, I guess, you know, that real um, grassroots feel as to how, how you're getting it done on the ground at that local level? Yes, it's true. In Burundi, yes, it's really decentralized uh, compared to the national level and local level. There are provinces, uh, there's the country, there are smaller communities and even lower level, there are the hills, there are the, the, the small villages. It's really decentralized. The head um, on a very local level, there are, um, there are councillors in order to manage the local uh, levels. There are committees that help us a lot. They try and uh, referee uh, everything that's going on. They try and manage uh, what's happening with the land and how uh, neighbors relate to each other. Yes, they are uh, committees, and these are the ones that are most active um, in working with us. We also have a council um, to handle any conflicts, and we have a mediation council as well. But we work a lot, well, we work more and more 
with committees, um, other types of committees that don't have specific roles um, outlined, outlined in terms of land administration. But we're concentrating on three things. Um, first of all, the committees that uh, have administration um, jobs and tasks that try and uh, handle the local com uh, committee, uh, handle local communities. They help local communities to uh, um, manage their land. We also have uh, recognition committees that have a certain amount of knowledge of our communities and that help us. They help us to decrypt the local land code. And they help us to be more active in our land registration. They're always uh, by our side to try and uh, define the limits and define uh, the borders of what we're doing between neighbors. There's also a council that tries to mediate any conflicts that occur between private individuals and private partners. In terms of our land usage, they help us a lot. Mm -hmm. They make sure that our methods are really at the service of our committees. They help the other two committees as well. But these are the three types of bodies that help us a lot in our land administration and in implementing it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank, thanks, Remy, um, for giving us that pretty detailed insight there on uh, the l use of these uh, three different but interrelated committees to, to help solve those issues, uh, or FFP application, I guess, at that, that local level. Um, I'm just a bit conscious of time, um, so I want to still go around for one more one more round of questions, but there is uh, now quite a lot of open questions in the Q&A panellists. So if you're not speaking panellists, and if you could, because uh, some of the questions are quite specific and targeted at, at some of what you've said. So if you do, if you could just jump onto the Q&A while we go through the next round of questions. Um, and if there's any directly at, uh, attributed to you that you feel comfortable to answer in just by typing, uh, that, that'd be great. So that's the Q&A box down the bottom screen. Okay, Christelle, going back to you again, uh, we've, we've talked about your role. We haven't really spoken specifically um, in, in so much detail about Benin. It's more of a recent case of FFP LA adoption. Um, I'm a bit cautious on how I ask the question <laughs> because um, it's, it, I don't want to say the country showed uh, 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 resistance, but um, can you sort of explain to us the, the approach for getting acceptance and then um, rolling out FFPLA in Benin? Yes, of course. Yeah, because, well, resistance to the fit for purpose approach, I cannot really say that is that is the case, uh, as you mentioned, but yeah, the, 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 of course, the way to get there, the way to get the, the to, to meet the objectives of the the, the, the Balinese government, that is, of course, well, a long path and for, full with hurdles and, and, and challenges, so to say. So, um, yeah, and that, of course, takes a lot of time and discussion. And this is a process where we are in uh, currently in. So key to speeding up the land administration process in Benin is uh, actually it's it's to establish a lighter form so uh, for, of um, uh, of registration so to say and um, yeah it is we do it with, with not establishing an ownership as an absolute right but to use other verification methods and establish a presumed ownership uh, during the period of data collection and in a later stage uh, after the period of data collection, it can be converted into a higher level of legal certainty. Uh, for example, um, yeah, the land title as, uh, is prescribed in the land law. And um, well, in contrast to the property rights documented by a land title, this presumed ownership that we now establish, it's not absolute and it can be disputed. And 
yeah, well, actually, we can say that it is applicable until a legal procedure decides otherwise. And, and this, um, well, this possibility for correction in the later stage provides space for a faster and cheaper and a less formal approach uh, during the phase of data collection. And this, again, it this aligns better with the political goal of achieving a land registration system that covers the entire country in a relatively short time frame. Um, so the possibility to register this kind of presumed ownership, this was already uh, regulated by law in 2013, uh, but it was only valid uh, during a transition period of 10 years. And yeah, as we are now 10 years later, this uh, law is not applicable anymore uh, since July this year. And the challenge is now to re-establish the legal regulation, so to say, to make maintenance of this presumed ownership possible again by law. Um, so at this moment, we are uh, we prepare the legal degrees and they are being composed and now uh, for endorsement uh, at the cabinet. Um, and yeah, I think this is my view, if I may say it like that, I think this really must be arranged, arranged before further scaling up. Uh, if not, uh, if we uh, mm -hmm. continue with data collection, uh, then we will create a database with unreliable data. And this, well, this would absolutely go against the, the Beninese objectives to bring this economic prosperity and to prevent land conflicts. So, yeah, actually, and I'm taking into account the time, uh, the, the limited uh, of time we have for this webinar, I think that is also my general message that I want to repeat. Do not scale up and do not invest in scaling up until the maintenance uh, is well established. And, and I'm talking about the maintenance of, of, of a land administration system itself, but, but, but more, okay. even better, the data in it. Okay. Thanks, Christelle. I think your point's pretty well made and clear. And it's, um, yeah, I think it's a good one. Let's, I'm conscious of time too, but I uh, want to quickly go through one last round of questions, as I said, but if I could ask the panelists to be as brief as possible so we can get through as many of the um, questions as possible. And I can see already some have started to be answered with it, which is excellent. So last round of questions, Israel, we'll start with you. Uh, what do you see as the remaining barriers to the use of FFPLA in the sub-Saharan African countries? you've been looking at in your study. Thank you so much, Rohan. Uh, according to that study in 2022, uh, as it turns within the surveying community, the legal profession and the general community was one of the things that was identified owing to a lack of sufficient advocacy and awareness and involvement of stakeholders. Now, uh, a, a prime focus was on the surveying community because uh, surveyors need to adapt to change and then leverage available technology. And the quest for perceived accuracy is a major challenge also for the fit for purpose land and nutrition approach. So both from the surveyors and organizations, we had uh, the the hesitancy was obvious because uh, you prepare some documents and then it's not the regular documents they are familiar with in the country. And then even the organizations will say they don't accept that because it's not the typical public plan that is accepted in such environments. So these are certain hesitancies that we identified. Uh, aside this particular one, I think a few things, maybe we have uh, some solutions that could help us uh, reduce such hesitancies, which is to advocate more. And then to let the local context, I mean, let the, the approach be adapted and then adopted by the local concept, uh, context rather, so that the problem can be uh, holistically solved. That's just the way I'm going to like to hand it up. Then uh, I have a few more things here that I would like, love to spend the cut of time. I'll just outline, let's say we have capacity building, we have adequate training, and possibly uh, including the concept into the curricula of students, such that students mm -hmm. now understand mm -hmm. that the land administration approach needs to be fit for purpose, even from the inception. And then lastly, I would like to emphasize on establishing legal and institutional frameworks to back up the uh, technology-enabled spatial environment. It's obvious that the spatial uh, aspect, the spatial framework is well advanced, but then the institutional and the legal that pertains that really talks, talks about the people and what happens in a local context is actually lagging behind and is dragging the foot of uh, the implementation of FFPLA approaches in sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you so Thank much, Ruan and everyone. Th 
Thanks, Israel. Uh, Virgo, over to you. Uh, you've already told us about the most recent innovations happening in Indonesia around UAVs and, and essentially crowdsourced um, imagery and, and, and so forth. What, what's on the horizon uh, from, in your view, in your position uh, for the coming years with regards to FFPLA in Indonesia? Uh, thanks, Rohan. Uh, as we know, uh, you know, the methodology, the techniques in, in surveying and mapping actually become uh, cheaper and cheaper, yeah, uh, become affordable uh, and affordable. So uh, next year, as 2024, we started to put the building in our cadaster. Right now, currently, our cadaster is only the plot, the parcels only, the polygon. So we will be using the artificial intelligent techniques uh, using the UAV. So probably starting this year, next year, 2024, we will put our uh, the building footprint uh, in our in our FFP in our cadaster map. And uh, don't talk about the accuracy of the footprint. As long as we have the footprint of the building, it's okay. Uh, that's uh, our policy for the next year. And then we also publish our our cadaster map in our website. So you can also take a look at our website. It's it's here probably uh, here. <laughs> Bumi.atrbpn.gui.id. Uh, it's not perfect yet. Uh, in some area, there still be uh, overlapping and gap between the new registered parcel and the legacy data, but in certain area, it's already uh, complete and systematic. So you can see our 107 million parcel in, in this web, website, uh, bumi.atrbpn.goid. And on those website only, because starting this year, we survey all the parcel, but not all the people get the certificate of title because probably the owner was not there, the owner uh, reluctant to have the title because if you have a title, you have to pay the tax, something like that. <laughs> and if you transfer, some, yeah, some people, few people, few people in Indonesia, reluctant, reluctant to have uh, the title. But uh, our policy starting this year, we should pay all the parcel. So also in this in this website, if they change their mind, probably next year or two years, they can come forward and make the the polygon green make the green uh, make the meaning they approve of their parcel so they can make approval later so not all the parcel surveyed has been approved so they can approve it later uh, using this uh, website and then the, starting next year also uh, probably our cadaster map will be will be using a terrain uh, so it will be in a 3d so we will be prepared for the for the incoming incoming years that two thirds of the people also in Indonesia will live in the city. So we'll, we we will be moving also to the to the three D cadaster once uh, all the parcel in Indonesia uh, has been registered, has been surveyed, and has been mapped. And lastly. Uh, we will also shifting our our organization now probably until the next five to two years we are organization that collect the data uh, from the people uh, later on we'll be shifting to the data manager the data manager and information about the land spatial unit in indonesia not just 2d but also 3d so the people can give us feedback the people can approve or disapprove and uh, using that using that technology, we will do our FFP uh, later on. Okay, thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Park Ferrigo. So fun, the fun never stops in uh, Indonesia and with ATR BPN, it seems. So uh, great to hear those innovations. Uh, Remy, one last one for you, um, yeah. and I'll get you to narrow in on you know what, what do you see as the next steps for FFPLA in Burundi? What are, what are, what are you hopeful about? What what do you see as the positives on the horizon in in that particular country? Yeah, that one was for you, Remy. I think are you still with us? Just the the 
just done being unsure with. Yep, yeah, you're there. Go, go. Uh, okay. uh, in terms of success for Burundi, on the level of administration, concerning Burundi and land administration, we clearly have willingness on a, a political level. And we're doing a lot of work with the uh, government administration to try and advance uh, rights and certify to certify these rights in terms of land ownership. There are also opportunities uh, with organizations that are kicking into gear in terms of land administration. Populations and communities are also very open and reacting with great enthusiasm on a community level to try and secure their land rights and obtain uh, land certificates. We do have certain challenges. These challenges are linked to the lack of legal texts, concrete legal texts. We also have challenges linked to the institutional frameworks and management frameworks that are currently uh, being negotiated, and they're all at different stages. There are further challenges as well linked to conflict concerning our uh, territories and private territories, private lands, for example. We also, there's also a certain challenge linked to many types of land that have economic problems. They're not necessarily exploitable, they're able to be used. But the land management system is currently sounding the alarm in terms of this. There are okay. different levels of success and different challenges that Burundi is faced with, but we're fighting for all of this together. Thank you very much, uh, Remy. Um, now, I do have one last question for you, Christelle, but I'm, uh, as, as a good friend, oh, I shouldn't say we're good friends in the context of the panel session, um, I think I think you made your your strongest point in the and, and the point you wanted to make in the last um, in the in the last round. Is there anything you want to add on to that before I just jump to uh, two participants that I can see online that it would be good to get a word in before we um, uh, before we wrap up the session? No, well, as you as you if I can repeat, I can repeat it, of course, but I think <laughs> <laughs> the message was clear. I can tell you so much more and I can tell, tell the audience so much more about the project in Benin. Uh, but uh, yeah, regarding the time, maybe, maybe we can certainly encourage uh, them to take a look at the Cadaster website and all the news about the Benin project. Exactly. And I know there's been uh, academic papers around that that cover some of the important points. I shared, a, I shared a link uh, to an article that we recently uh, published in the GIM uh, International yeah, Connecting. Exactly. So, uh, yeah. No, thanks. Thanks, Christelle. So I thanks to all the panelists. And we just, you know, there's obviously we've had 24 questions come in. And thank you so much for the engagement of all the uh, question aunts, uh, questioners there. And I can see our panelists have been busy providing answers and have, have got through almost half of those. So please do keep going panelists if you can see specific ones relating to you. Some of them are very, um, you know, to be unpacked and could, we could spend a whole nother webinar on them and maybe that they'll form part of the scaling, uh, a responsible scaling uh, series that's going on here at um, with Land Portal. Uh, but I did, um, you know, we've got five minutes left and I can see um, we've got two panel, well, not panellists, but participants that I hope are on standby to give us their their views and their different roles. Um, first one is uh, Simon Peter. Are you Are you there, Simon? Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Yeah, I can. It's good to good to hear from you. And uh, again, can you give us a little bit of uh, a quick take on on your your position currently and how it interacts with the FFPLA concepts and your your general views on that? That'd be great. Thanks, Rohan, and uh, thanks for this interesting uh, discussion. 
Um, so, so, so first of all, I want to uh, emphasize that fit for purpose land administration is a paradigm shift from the conventional or the traditional way of um, doing land administration or land management um, to this new way of, you know, finding uh, uh, a faster way to do it and provide tenure security. And that uh, precisely because of this, it's not always um, a, a smooth transition. So there are a lot of things involved to have this um, shift. Um, so so from, for, from our experience in Uganda, um, one of the key consideration is um, to make sure that the government um, uh, is in the lead or you know, takes the leadership. And this is not always uh, given. Um, of course, there are countries uh, like Indonesia, uh, the case we just had, and Nepal, um, where the government quickly, um, you know, um, accepts the fit for purpose land administration. In Uganda, that was not the case. So um, one of the things we did was, uh, you know, the SOC systems um, uh, change model. Uh, so where you um, pick an area and uh, together, of course, with government and implement the fit for purpose and show them how um, this will lead to uh, quicker and better results. And so um, using this approach, uh, we have been able to progressively uh, show the government uh, what's possible with it, uh, with the fit for purpose land administration. And um, with this, uh, they have now uh, developed um, a national strategy on how to implement the fit for purpose land administration. The remaining challenge in Uganda with fit for purpose land administration is um, resource mobilization. Uh, so, so the land sector is not a priority in the overall um, uh, in, the, in the overall resource allocation of the country. Um, so, so, so. So, so the, the, the resources that are needed to be able to scale up fit for purpose and provide tenure security um, within the next 10 years, as their strategy says, have not yet been found. So one of the things we are doing now is also look at um, um, developing a business model, uh, because as we know, uh, land administration uh, provides um, uh, revenue. Uh, for the government. So, so the government, um, we are trying to advocate uh, together with our partners in the Ministry of Lands to the wider government, um, uh, making a case that fit for purpose can actually uh, result into increase, increase in revenue and therefore making a case for um, the initial investment that is needed uh, for the fit for purpose to be um, funded and implemented at national scale. The second point I wanted to make, Rohan, um, is to emphasize uh, the importance of, um, of gender in, in, in both the conceptualization of fit for purpose land administration and the implementation uh, of it. So, so, so I agree with, um, I think one of the speakers was emphasizing that more often we focus on the, on the spatial framework and um, sometimes um, ignore the social dynamics, the you know the, the cultural uh, context and, and other important uh, governance elements, um, as well. Um, uh, also, um, you know, fit for purpose land administration is often implemented in the context where there are certain uh, governance challenges. I mean, a good example is corruption. So if you don't put in place uh, safeguards. Um, it's possible that, you know, within the scaling up of fit for purpose and its implementation, you could actually um, scale up some of those, um, you know, uh, negative uh, aspects of, of, uh, of, of, land, of land administration. So I think it is really important to uh, integrate um, these governance issues uh, in the design of what's fit for purpose, but also involve um, all key stakeholders. 
Uh, one of the other challenge in the case of Uganda was the professionals, so the land surveyors, and yeah. and 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 and, and you, it's really critical to make sure that all stakeholders are on board um, if fit for purpose uh, land administration is to be scaled up. So one of the things we have been doing is the advocacy with the professionals um, because fit for purpose land administration, what it does, it changes the role of, 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 the, of some of the professionals. Yeah. So we have been uh, advocating and explaining um, what is their new role uh, within the fit for purpose um, land administration. And, and I think that that is uh, also helping a lot. So because of great, uh, lack great. of time, I'll stop here for now. And no, over great, to you. great. Thanks, Simon, Peter. And I think you've raised some issues that probably we didn't highlight enough, but maybe they'll, they'll come up in other webinars around, around gender and the specific changing role of the of the of the surveyor and the professionals involved in land administration look uh, we are completely out of time so big apologies to all those questions that didn't get answered we've had excellent engagement in the session excellent uh, attendance um, but thank you for posting all those questions um, many, as I said many of them we've answered but we haven't got quite through them all and haven't been able to get to them in the in in the forum here with our speakers but I do as we wrap up want to say a big thank you to our panelists, Christelle, Virgo, Remy, and Israel. You've been brilliant. Thank you for sharing your insights uh, for your, from your own work, but putting that on the, on the global stage, I guess, and showing um, the relevance of your work in that regard. Thanks also to all our attendees and those who've asked questions for joining us here today. We really do appreciate your participation and the engagement, and we look forward to seeing you next time in uh, one of our land portal um, webinars. So stay tuned, as always, to the emails and to the website. Uh, we'd also like you to take the survey. Uh, we want to know how you liked the webinar, what worked, what didn't. We're always looking to improve. So you can take that by clicking the link, which I believe Neil has already posted online in the chat and with that i would uh just like to sign off uh, i wish you all a good uh, morning or good afternoon or good evening and we'll see you next time uh bye for now bye